And we're going to be reading from uh, Romans chapter 8, so you'll want to turn there and uh, read along with me, starting in, in verse 1 of Romans chapter 8. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, Brian and Amanda. That was a blessing. Romans chapter 8. This morning we're looking at, I am forever free, or free forever from condemnation. Notice verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are, under, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you are alive according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For if you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, fellow heirs of Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we might also be glorified with him. Let's pray. Father, thank you again so much for your presence with us. We ask for your blessing on your word this morning and also as we segue into uh, the communion time as well. We pray that our hearts might be ready for that. And we ask for your blessing in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Paul starts, Paul starts his train of thought with the word condemnation. Condemnation. We see it there in verse 1 of chapter 8. If you take notice, condemnation would be our position apart from Christ. In fact, condemnation is what Paul was actually describing in the previous chapters. That wretched state every Christian struggles with because of the presence of sin. Now, the cross eradicated the power of sin, but not the presence of sin. We still, in a very, we, live in, we still live in a very sinful world, don't we? And we ourselves are prone to wander prone to do the things that God would not want us to do according to the scripture. So although the power of sin has been eradicated by the cross, not the presence of sin. And so it is that wretched state that every Christian struggles with because of the presence of sin and, and, and the wretched position each person stands in apart from Christ's redemption. Uh, because of our fallen and sinful nature. And because of that, the presence of sin clings to us like a de decaying corpse that we cannot seem to rid ourselves with. And Paul, it causes Paul, if you notice in chapter 7, verse 24, it causes Paul to cry out, O oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? So Paul is overcome, uh, laid waste, if you will, struggling because of this, what he calls wretchedness that he is, this body of death. It's like, in Paul's words, a, you know, the presence of sin is kind of like, in Paul's words, a decaying corpse that's clinging to his body. And he, he drew that from his day. It was, it was a, 
an example from his day, uh, what they would do to criminals in those days. But anyways, he said sin was like that to him. It was like a, a body of death, a decaying corpse that was strapped to him, and he couldn't seem to rid himself from it, the presence of sin. It seemed to be chipping away at him and eating away at him. And it's not that Paul had given over to the presence of sin. It's not that, that he was engrossed in, in habitual acts of sin. Paul wasn't practicing unrighteousness. That doesn't mean that he didn't sin from time to time. Even though he was an apostle, he was a sinner like you and I, right? Sinners tend to do what? We tend to sin, that's right, even the apostles. So it's just that the pool of sin, okay, the, the nature of sin, the, the presence of sin that we live around this, uh, was warring against his new nature and causing a great deal of agony and discomfort with Paul's true desire which was to live righteously before the Lord without the hindrance of that sin nature. Paul wanted to be unhindered in his worship, unhindered in his, in his uh, fellowship, unhindered with his commitment to the Lord as he walked with the Lord, and the presence of sin was hindering him as it does us. And so I love this chapter, chapter 7 and chapter 8, because it, it, makes, uh, it makes it relevant for me because Paul, 2,000 years ago, was struggling with the same things that I struggle with at times. And just as a side note, Paul wrote Romans le way later and beyond his conversion. I think it's some 30 years, possibly 40 years after he was converted. So this isn't a new Christian writing this. This is a man who's been walking out his faith for all those years and still finding a struggle with the presence of sin. Anyways, this is one of those marks of a truly converted person that he, that he desires to please the Lord with, with all that he does. In other words, he wants to be Christ-centered. He wants to be Christ-focused. He wants to live as one who has surrendered to the flesh in the context of no longer being slayed by it, but now living a life surrendered to Christ. And so a Christ-centered person seeks to obey the Word in every area of his life. He wants to obey the Lord in the area of his marriage. He wants to obey the Lord in the area of his work. You know, the Scripture talks about just about every aspect of life. The Bible gives instruction on marriage, on work, on finances, in his relationships with people in and, in and, out, in and outside of the church. Paul, uh, you know, and those who want to be Christ-centered want to live that way as a Christian, obedient to the Scriptures in and out of the church. Sometimes we, we put on a, a church smile, right, on Sunday mornings, uh, but we don't take that smile out with us into the world, some people may not even know we're Christians out into the world, but they should know, right? So not only inside the church, but outside the church, we should be living and desiring to live a Christ-centered life. Also, in our thought life, how many of you practice good thought life? You don't have to raise your hand. Don't do that. But uh, you think about that. Even in our, our, our thought life, we want to live uh, a Christ-centered life, as Paul said in Philippians chapter 4. Think on the good things um, in our actions in our reactions, and in our lives as whole. However, the, the sin nature can be a hindrance to that. It really can. And that's why Paul speaks of presenting our bodies as living sacrifices uh, in chapter 12. So let's go over to chapter 12 for just a minute. Take a look at that. We're in chapter 8. We'll be going back over there so you can mark that. And then we'll be going over to, and we're going into Romans chapter 12 right now. This is another one of my favorite passages in Romans. Have you read through the book of Romans? I have read through Romans so many times, I can't even count it anymore. It was one of the books that I just, when I first got saved, I read through John, the Gospel of John, over and over and over again. I read through Matthew over and over again. I read through Romans over and over again. I tried to read through Hebrews. You know how difficult that can be. Hebrews, I've read through it before several times. In fact, I've read through the Bible countless times uh, in all the years that I've been a Christian. But Romans was one that I tended to spend a lot of time on and have spent a lot of study in. Because it, it, it's so um, relevant to the human nature in many ways, but deeply theological. Deeply theological. Anyways, notice what Paul says in Romans 12. He says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, or a living holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind this is, this is beyond chapter 7, beyond chapter 8. Now he's getting to the practical side of things here. How do we do that? How do we live a life that's not condemned? How do we live a life that's not really struggling with you know, the, the sinful nature? He tells us here. 
He speaks of that. He speaks of, the, the, of what enables us, gives us the enablement of living out our, who we are in Christ. He tells us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And of course, we know the way we renew our, renew our mind is through the Scripture, through reading it, memorizing it, obeying it, hearing it, applying it, all these things, so that you may prove what is the will of God that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So here Paul speaks of what, is, what it is that gives us the enablement of living who we are in Christ. Here, who we are in Christ, we are free forever from condemnation. That's who we are in Christ. The uncondemned live this way, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Presenting our bodies, as Paul says, as living sacrifices. This is how the uncondemned live. Uh, they're living sacrifices because we're not dead, but we're alive in Christ. In the Old Testament, the sacrifices were dead. They killed them before they sacrificed them. We are not dead. We are alive. We are alive in Christ. And because of this, Paul says we are holy and acceptable living sacrifices. This is something that Paul wants you to get a hold of. He got a hold of this. It's the theological truth. We are holy and acceptable before God. Thus, holy and acceptable living sacrifices. This is why Paul urges us by the mercies of God. Christ's redemptive work on the cross falls within the mercies of God. Mercies, plural, do you see that? Mercies of God, not just one mercy, but oh, a whole slew of them. Mercies of God, probably infinite amount, so much of God's mercy, thus making us holy and acceptable and able to present ourselves as living sacrifices. This is an exciting truth when you think about it. The work of God, the work of redemption that God has done in us, making us holy and acceptable living sacrifices. You don't have to worry about making yourself holy. You can't. You don't have to worry about making yourself acceptable. You can't. God has done that. He has. And so Paul says, because of that, this is, this is the very heart of our spiritual worship. We are living sacrifices presentable to God by His mercies or because of His mercies. And because of this, there's no condemnation back in Romans chapter 8. We're made holy, acceptable, when? At conversion. That's when it took place, and it was complete. It was a complete uh, conversion, a complete changing of who we are in Christ. At conversion, we were made completely righteous, completely holy, completely acceptable, thus a living sacrifice. Uh, and this explains then the need to know why there's no condemnation. You see, like Paul, the truly converted have a keen awareness of sin and are not usually comfortable with it. I'll say that again. The, the truly converted have a, have a keen awareness of sin and we're never comfortable with it. That's how we know we're Christians. Sin bothers us. I hope, I hope it bothers you. When you do that, we might try to hide from it, and we do. We do. We try to hide from it. Uh, maybe excuse it. Oh, I'm just human. How many of you try to use that excuse sometimes? You don't have to raise your hand. Uh, I'm, just, I'm only human, and God's a forgiving God. And so we'll excuse it, or we'll try to hide from it, or we'll try to rationalize it. We'll try to take it out of the context of Scripture. We're talking about sin here, sinful behavior. The very fact that we live with the presence of sin, we may, we may feel trapped by it. You know, what do we do about this sin in my life? Whatever that particular sin might be, we feel trapped by it. I'm never comfortable with it, believers. Notice what Paul says about this in chapter 7, of the same book, Romans chapter 7. Let's go take a look at that. This is where Paul gets very personal. Very personal. And again, it's a comfort to me because... Paul is an apostle here, and, and we would think that apostle would, would have this down perfectly and not be uh, struggling or overcome by things like this. But he, he, he's, he's admitting a struggle here, right? Notice verse 14. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh. Okay, the law, the word of God is spiritual. It is. God's word is spiritual. It's powerful. It's active. It's very active. It's how God communicates to us. Wayne was telling me, Wayne, Wayne um, Walker was telling me the other day, he says God talks to him every morning 
thinking, oh no, one of those nuts that says he hears from God all the time, you know. Uh, he says, every time I open the Bible, every morning when I open the Bible, God talks to me. That is exactly true. That is theologically sound. He's saying the law is spiritual. The word of God is spiritual. That's what he's referring to here. But I am flesh. I am flesh. There's a, there's a contradiction between the living word of God and myself, who is made of flesh. He goes, on, he goes on to say that I'm sold into bondage to sin. The law is spiritual. The law is powerful. The law has a great mandate to live as holy and righteous as we are. And yet I am made of flesh. I am carnal, sold into sin, bent that way. I have this bend in me. I have this crook in me that says I'm a sinner. And I, my natural course is to, to sin. Paul is saying here, verse 15, For what I am doing, I don't understand. I can't figure it out. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Remember, he's talking about the struggle here with the presence of sin in his life. I can't figure it out. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. And yet I have this contradiction in my life. That's what he says. I am doing the very thing I hate. I hate it too. Don't you hate it, Christian? Don't you hate it when you fall into the, the sins of the world, the temptations of the world? Are you just, just living according to your sinfulness, your fallen state? Did you hate that? Paul hated that. He did. But if, verse 16, but if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. Why? Because the law says that all have sinned. The law says I am a sinner and it condemns me. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willingness is present in me. I want to do good, but the doing of the good, I can't seem to find the power to do it. For the good that I want, I do not do, but the practice, the very evil that I do, I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now Paul's referring to himself as the new man, the one who is in Christ, and the old nature that's weighing him down like a dead corpse that's been strapped to him, sucking the life out of him. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God, but on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. So Paul is saying there's a dichotomy in the Christian life. There's a dichotomy. A side of me that wants to do good and does practice good and a side of me that tends to want to go the other direction and many times I find myself there. He's struggling with it. But he says, here's the consolation. It's in Christ. Christ has taken care of the part that condemns me on the cross. And he says, on one hand, I myself... In my mind, I'm serving the law of God, but on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. There is a dichotomy there. It's there. And I'm glad Paul wrote this 30 or 40 years later after his conversion because it's still there. This, this dichotomy, this contention is still there. This tension between who I am in Christ and who I used to be before I became a Christian. It's still there. The struggle is still there. So you can see both the struggle Paul had with the indwelling sin nature and then the consolation he felt. He did have consolation there because of Christ's redemptive work on the cross. As he says there in verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And chapter 7 actually sets up the stage for Paul's great dissertation in chapter 8, the no condemnation chapter. He says, look, there's this heavy weight, this dichotomy, this duplicity, this struggle. Then he, and then he goes into chapter 8 and says, but there's no condemnation. You may feel condemned. You may think you're condemned because you can't seem to rid yourself from this, this corpse, this sin that just weighs you down and causes you to do the things you don't want to do. But you're not condemned by that. And Paul never 
if he had never written the latter part of chapter 7 and then chapter 8, every Christian would be hard-pressed about what to do with that guilt, that condemning feeling we have over our sinful nature. We wouldn't know what to do with it. For one, I'm very thankful and I'm actually quite blessed to know that because I'm in Christ, I am forever free from the condemnation of sin. That's what Paul tells us with the Word of God. I am forever free from the condemnation of sin. I'm also comforted in knowing that even when I sin, this is important to understand, even when I sin, there's still no condemnation. Even when I sin. John, the apostle, had some very profound words to say about this truth. I want you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. Okay? Even when I sin, because Christ took care of all my sin on the cross, right? All of it. Yesterday, today, forever. Now, I could get into particular sins, but I don't need to do that. I don't need to say, I don't need to try to balance out, well, what sin is, you know, less condemning than another. It doesn't matter. Christ has taken care of all sin on the cross. And he declares through the pen of the Apostle Paul that we are not condemned. If we were left condemned then sin would kill us like a, like, a, like a corpse that is strapped to us. Can you imagine if you had to carry a dead corpse around strapped to you? What it would do to you? It would kill you. It would, it would take the very life out of you. All the disease that would come from that rotting flesh would take over your body and you would die. And this is what Paul says sin would do without the freeing, regenerating power of, this, of God, the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. The power of God's word in our lives. Amen. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you, and he means what he's written previously in chapter 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. That's what he says here. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. He means mankind is what he's talking about there. Now the Apostle John gives an interesting contrast. First he says, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. In other words, he wants to make us aware of our sin nature and to be on guard about it. He doesn't want us to just live According to the flesh, just let, the sin, let, just let sin have its way. That's what he's saying here. I don't, I've written these things so you won't let sin just have its way over you. Because it will. Really, if you just lay down and let your flesh have its way, boy, you, pretty soon you won't be looking like you're a Christian and people won't believe you when you say you are. So he says he wants to make us aware of our sin nature in case there's some doubt about it. He talks about it in chapter 1, verse 5 through 10, which we're not going to read. And also saying that in becoming aware of our sin, we should guard against sinning. We should. Even though sin doesn't condemn us, we should guard against it. It doesn't please God when we allow sin in our lives. And this is what he means when he says, so that you may not sin. A spirit-filled Christian, or as spirit-filled Christians, we have the capacity to say no to sin. Did you know that? I don't know if you knew that or not, but you have the power within you to say no to sin. If you were to go to chap uh, Titus chapter 2, I think it is. Let's go there for just a second. It's not in my notes, but it just popped up in my head. Has that ever happened to you? Something just popped, you're studying over here and something pops up over somewhere else and it's, it's relevant to what you're studying. Titus, now if I can just find Titus, is that in the New Testament? <laughs> yeah, it is. Notice chapter 2 in Titus. This is another one of my favorite passages of Scripture because it kind of confirms the fact that we have the power to say no to sin. It says in verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. That's a reference to Christ. It really is. The grace of God is Christ. Remember, he was full of grace and truth. And he, he brought salvation to all men, okay, all classifications of men, Jews, Gentiles, rich, poor, uh, wealthy, um, those that are well and those that are sick. I mean, just all classifications of men. And, and he says, what, what does it do? This, this, the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. 
it instructs us or teaches us to say no or to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. So God's grace, the grace of God that brought Christ down to the world, the grace of God that, that brought about our salvation, the grace of God that made uh, God incarnate, the grace of God that, that died on the cross for our sins and, and lied in the grave uh, for three days and then rose again on the third day, giving us eternal life. That grace of God teaches us, that same grace of God teaches us to say no, to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and it empowers us to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, in this world, in other words. Not just in the age to come, but in this world. But we don't always walk in the Spirit. If you notice the passage that we're looking at back in 1 John, you want to go back over there. A spirit-filled Christian, we have the capacity to say no, as we see in Titus chapter 2. But we don't always walk in the Spirit saying no to sin. How many of you could say amen to that? I think we would all say that. We don't all walk. We're not always continually walking in the Spirit. I think we could. It's possible because Titus says it's possible. And so does John here in 1 John. It is possible. So he adds, because we don't always walk in the Spirit, we're not always saying no to sin, he adds what? If anyone sins, do you see that? It's conditional. If anyone sins, okay, if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself, the propitiation for our sins. And so like Paul, John makes it clear that even when we sin, I like to say not if, but when, even when we sin, our sin doesn't condemn us. Because we have an advocate with the Father. Advocate here is the equivalent of a defense lawyer. Some of you may be in the courts or something like that, and you know all about this kind of thing. This is legal, uh, legal jargon here. He's using legal terms as if he was a, a lawyer of some sort. And, you know, the Roman, Roman law back in the first century was very legal. It had a lot, of, a lot of legal policies, a lot of legal precedents. They had written documents and had court and... It was like our, like our own country, full of laws and regulations. And so he's using these terms here. So advocate with the Father, advocate here is the equivalence of a defense lawyer. And a defense lawyer is, is tasked with the responsibility of making sure you get acquitted. That's what's happening here. And that your crimes are not held against you. That's what a defense lawyer does. Even if you've committed crimes, he's there to ensure that you don't get what you deserve. He's on your side. He's in your defense. He's going to make sure that he convinces the jury that uh, you didn't do it. And there's not enough evidence to convict you. Your crimes aren't held against you, even if you've committed crimes. This is an advocate. In the literal sense, it means one who stands alongside you. I'm sure that if you found yourself in court... God forbid you haven't, but if you found yourself in court, you're sure happy to have a lawyer there to kind of defend you, right? Even if you know in your own mind you're guilty. You're hoping that that lawyer can really advocate for you and get you a lighter sentence or no sentence at all. So it means someone who stands alongside you. And who is the advocate in this particular place in the context of what John's talking about here? Spiritually speaking, he says it is who? Jesus Christ. Who? Jesus Christ, the righteous, the NASB says. The righteous. And notice how John adds the emphasis by referring to Jesus Christ as the righteous. As Jesus Christ advocates or stands alongside us, making us sure we don't get what we deserve, which is punishment for our sin. What is the wages of sin? Can someone tell me? What's the wages of sin, the Bible says in Romans? Jesus is making sure we don't get death. Spiritual death. He's our advocate. He went on the cross and took death for us. He suffered death for us so that we don't have to experience that. Remember, he felt separated from his father because of the wages of sin. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have thee forsaken me? You won't experience being forsaken by God. He did. He did. He was my advocate. He is my advocate. And so, 
as Christ advocates or stands alongside us, making us sure we don't get what we deserve, which is punishment for our sins, it's, a, it's from or out of his righteousness that we stand acquitted. I believe this is why John has the word the righteous there, just to make sure everyone knows why Jesus can advocate for us. He can advocate for us because he's righteous. He alone is righteous. And he further qualifies this by adding verse 2. Look what he says in verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And when John says he himself, John applies that Jesus Christ the righteous is the only propitiation for our sins. There are no other propitiations but Christ himself. Propitiator, if you will. There are none other than Christ himself. No one else except a righteous, sinless, perfect sacrifice could ever meet the holy standards that God has set against sin. And so God requires a perfect, sinless, blood sacrifice, and Jesus has met that standard by presenting himself. He presented himself as a perfect, sinless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of mankind. He presented himself as the atonement for our sins. And this is why God became flesh. This is what the incarnation is about. God became flesh so he could be what? He could shed his blood and die. That's why he became flesh. He was perfect, sinless, and was able to shed that perfect sacrifice on the cross, shed his blood for the remission of sins. And so a propitiation then was an acceptable sacrifice offered for the forgiveness of sin, which when offered up properly, satisfies God's hatred towards sin. God's anger, God's anger, his wrath. I try to say wrath and anger there together, ranger. Okay, God's wrath and anger was satisfied by Christ's work on the cross. Therefore, your sin doesn't condemn you. It cannot and will not condemn you. Even though you sin. Even though you sin. Because it's a given, we're going to sin. John says, I don't want you to sin, don't practice sin, but if you sin, when you sin, you have an advocate. You have a propitiation. You have an atonement. You have somebody who's taken that for you. The punishment. So even if we sin, and we do, much more than we should, amen? Am I the only one there? Or even have to sin, much more than we should and even have to sin. We shouldn't have to sin. We're not being forced to. We do it because we get over to the flesh, right? Right? But even when we sin, we're not condemned because we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, as a side note, and I always feel like I need to do this, okay? I always got to give you a side note. Because there's going to be, there's going to be people out there who are called the super grace people. And, and where Paul says, you know, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. The super grace people want to say, okay, well, if I'm not condemned for my sin, and if all my sin has been taken care of on the cross, and even if I sin, I have an advocate uh, and Christ, my propitiation, it doesn't matter what I do. I can just go sin, 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 sin city. And just let it all just kind of, right? And Paul says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So we all just go out and sin so grace may abound? What does he say to that? He says, God forbid that, you know. So as a side note, let's not con con confuse Jesus' advocacy with a wholesale license to go out and just do whatever it is you want to do according to your fleshly dictates. This kind of thinking will only result in reaping a consequence for deliberate and willful sin. There's always a consequence for your sin. Especially if it's deliberate and willful. Even more so. Which is a topic for another day, but let's remember this as we practice our Christianity that this is not a license to just go out and do whatever you want to do, however you want to do it, according to your fallen nature. Let's go back to Romans 8 and we'll, we'll finish up. We have communion this morning as well. I just think this is a great segue to that. So we're looking primarily at verses 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. And so Paul's consolation for the previous chapters is found in this profound liberating truth in verses 1 through 4. Paul didn't write what he wrote in the previous chapters so we can continue to struggle with indwelling sin, even though we do. He wrote what he did so we could get to chapter 8 and the following chapters so that he might liberate our minds and our emotions. That's what he wants to do. He wants to liberate us. I want to be liberated, don't you? I want to live a liberated life in Christ. 
I don't want to feel condemned because of the sin that I do commit. I want to know that if I repent of that, I acknowledge it and I repent of it, that's it, it's over. There may be some consequence, but at least I'm not going to be forever condemned for it. And that's what's important, and this is what Paul is saying. Don't worry about being condemned. You will not be. Live free as though your advocate has advocated for you and you were acquitted because you are. So we don't want to live with these condemning feelings that come because of the presence of sin in our lives. The presence of sin remains until we're rid of it. And when do we get rid of the presence of sin? In our life, when do we get rid of the presence of sin? Can someone tell me? How do we get rid of it? We die. We leave this world and we go into the next. There is no sin in heaven, amen? Until the Lord puts away with this universe and this creation, until God ends this world, sin remains in the world and the propensity to sin with it. The presence of sin remains until we are rid of it at glorification, but it doesn't mean that we have to be debilitated by it or enslaved to it. In fact, Paul gets to chapter 8 to show us that in Christ, that is, in a right relationship with him, in other words, those who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit, which speaks of one who's saved, we can have freedom from the condemning thoughts and actions that Paul struggled with in chapter 7. This should liberate our mind. This should liberate our emotion. This should liberate us and free us to live, Romans chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. It should do that. That's why Paul wrote it. We can now live as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable living sacrifices. This is the power that we get to live the Christian life, to be a witness in the world, to be a witness in the church, to live a powerful, effective life for Christ. This is where we get that power. We can have freedom from those things. And the freedom comes about by a, a, a correct understanding and, um, of what the Lord has done for us. But not only a correct understanding, but an embracing of it, or a, a taking ownership of the truth. That having been not only set free in Scripture, <coughs> but accomplished <coughs> in the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and then acting upon it. We're supposed to act upon the Scripture. That's why I used the word practice earlier. We practice our faith. We practice our Christianity. We do. We apply it. We walk in it. We live it out. Or simply, we believe it. We believe it. Believing gives power, doesn't it? If you believe something, it gives power to whatever it is you believe. It gives the power to enact what it is you believe. Now, throughout Romans... Paul's been contrasting man's total depravity and sin with Christ's uncondemning, uncondemning, justifying, substituting, and sanctifying work of the cross in Romans 8. In chapter 3, he speaks of our justification in Christ. In chapter 6, our union with Christ. In chapter 7, our identification with Christ. And this is the reason for the word therefore in chapter 8. It's a response to the epistle as a whole. And Paul takes... First chapter 7, then he funnels us down there. If you look at that, he takes chapter 7 and he funnels them down to this one awesome and compelling truth that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Christians will never be condemned to eternal death or separation from God in a place called hell because of sin. Never. We may suffer consequences, as I said, for deliberate and willful sin on, while we're on earth, but we'll never experience hell Never eternal condemnation if we are in Christ. Amen. Listen to what the Apostle John had to say on the subject of condemnation. In, in chapter 3, verse 17, he said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. So you see, hell is for those who... After hearing the truth about Jesus Christ, reject it and say no to his offer of salvation. Listen to what John says about those who reject Christ. In the same chapter, he says in verse 18, He who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. And then Paul in chapter 8 is speaking of those who have come to the light. As John said, he who believes in him is not condemned. Now, 
How is it that there's no condemnation? Notice verse 1 of Romans 8. Gives us the first answer. Do you see it? Are you looking there? Who are those who are not condemned? Yeah, those who are in Christ, exactly. That one tiny little word in has such a redeeming quality to it, doesn't it? So one little two-letter word that is incredibly profound and very, very important to our salvation. Those who are in Christ. It's used this way, in Christ, over 110 times in the New Testament. You would think that was important, right? The Holy Spirit used the word in Christ 110 times, depending on your translation. And one translator, the Goodspeed translation, substituted the word in with the word union. The word union. Instead of in, union. So, union with Christ, which actually explains what the word means when we use it in conjunction with Christ. To be in Christ means to be in union with Christ, linked to Christ, to be one with Christ, to be of Christ, to be born of Christ, to be a union with Christ. You know what a union is? It's to be one with Him. Colossians, in Colossians, Paul says, hidden with Christ. There's no condemnation to those who are in union with Christ. And in verses 4 or verses 1, depending on your translation, Paul shows us what those who are in Christ look like. He says, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. How many of you walk according to the Spirit as Christians? I can't ask that for the unbeliever. But how many of you are progressively walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh? You don't have to raise your hand. I just want you to think about that. Am I a believer in Christ? Am I walking according to the Spirit? Is my pursuit to walk according to the Spirit in obedience to the Word of God? Because that's how you walk according to the Spirit. You walk according to the Spirit in obedience to the Word of God. Right. The psalm says, how does a man cleanse his way? How does he cleanse his way? By taking heed unto thy word, O Lord. It's obeying the Word of God that brings about the walk of the Spirit. When you don't obey the Word, you don't live your life according to the Scriptures, you grieve the Spirit, and then you walk in the flesh. You, you repent and you obey the Word that's why you're supposed to know the Word. You're supposed to study the Word so you can show yourself or prove them to God. You're supposed to read it and study it. You're supposed to be in it all the time so you can know what God wants for you in your life you can, so you can know how to live for God. And as you live for God in accordance to His Word, in obedience to His Word, you walk in the Spirit. It empowers you to walk in the Spirit. If we don't pick up the Bible or open it only on Sunday mornings we're here in church, how powerful are you going to be in living the Christian life? You're not. It's gonna, you're going to walk out that door and in just a few seconds the power to walk the Christian life will be gone. It's only in consuming it. That's why I said by, in, in chapter 12, by renewing the mind, he means in the context of Scripture. You can only renew the mind in the context of Scripture. Only the Bible has the renewing, transforming power to empower you to walk a Christian life. Now, in conclusion, I know this might sound radical for some people, but the believer, even though he still has a propensity to sin and, and oftentimes, oftentimes does, is not condemned. This is what we're talking about. This is who I am in Christ. I am forever free from condemnation. We still need to repent and walk away from sin. Is that agreed? We still need to repent and walk away from sin. We do not let sin have its way in our body. Paul says that in Romans. Don't let sin have its way. Don't. But when we sin, and we're going to, oftentimes we do. It doesn't condemn us. We still need to repent. But we'll never be condemned because of it. So let's understand that those who are in Christ will never face spiritual death. Christians will spend eternity with Christ and never know what hell is like. Never. I don't want to know what hell is like. And I don't want you to know what hell is like. And I don't want anyone to know what... The only person who should know what hell is like is Satan and his angels. They're the only ones that should know what hell is like. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who, don't walk, who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. The big, the big question is then, is there anyone here who is not in a union, a spiritual union with Christ, if you're not sure about where you stand with Christ today? If you're not uh, walking according to the Spirit, if, if you haven't done that, 
You know, see, let me, let me try to explain something. Christianity isn't just lip service. Christianity isn't saying, yeah, I believe in God. We all think that it's, if we can just pro- profess that, we can just say, yeah, I believe in God. I believe there's a God. I know a lot of people that believe that there's a God. I know a lot of people that will say, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. It's kind of, it used to be kind of an American thing to say, right? Not anymore, but it used to be. It used to equate, you know, God and America. You know, you're American, you're... You believe in God, and God we trust. That's not true anymore, but it used to be. But people still think that just because they have a head profession with their mouth means that they're a Christian. The Bible doesn't confirm that. In fact, the Bible denies that. It does. It says just because you have a religion, just because you believe that there's a God, doesn't mean you're on your way to heaven. It doesn't mean that you, are, you stand uncondemned and acquitted for your sin. There has to be a, a regeneration that has taken place. There has to be a work of the Holy Spirit through the Word, through the preaching of the Word, uh, a, a recognizing that you are a sinner and a surrendering to that and coming to Christ by faith as the Spirit draws you. And then, and then, and here's the hard part, truly walking it. That's, that's the proof of our profession. Do we walk in accordance to the scriptures. So much so, we believe in the scriptures so much so that it empowers us to walk in it. That's the reality that Paul is talking about in this passage of scripture. That's true Christianity. What priority does the scripture play in our lives, if any? Or how much? If you haven't made that commitment to the scripture, to walk with Christ, to follow him and live as he would, and his apostles instructed us to, Maybe your profession is just profession. And when you die, you'll be one of those in Romans or in, in Matthew 7 that says, Lord, Lord, did I not preach in your name? Did I not prophesy in your name? Didn't I do miracles in your name? And the Lord will say to you, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. It's a scary thought, don't you think? To think that because you said you believed in God that that was enough to get you to heaven and you found out that it wasn't enough because it was no, there was nothing beyond the profession? No evidence? No evidence? The greatest evidence, the scripture says, is what this book means to you. What this book means to you. That's why Paul tells us in Romans 12 to not be conformed to this world but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's talking about adherence to scripture and its authority Do you know the bible is the christian's authority did you know that it's our final authority it is the authority by which we live our life yeah well let's pray So how do we come to a saving knowledge? Not just a head knowledge, but an actual conversion. A real conversion. How does that happen? Well, the Bible says that we have sinned. And we've talked a lot about that. Where We've used that word probably more today than most people use in their whole life, the word sin. Most churches don't even use the word sin anymore. It's not seeker friendly. It offends. It's not politically correct to use the word sin anymore. To refer to someone as a sinner. But the Bible, man, if you, if you marked how many times the word sin was used in the Bible, you'd be counting for a long time. So first of all, the Bible says you've sinned. And, and if you're honest, you're going to have to say it's true. Because it's true. And because it's true, you stand condemned in God's holy courtroom. That's what Paul was telling us from... Romans 1 to Romans 7, you stand condemned in God's holy courtroom. You will stand condemned in his courtroom. And you do stand condemned in his courtroom. But he's made a way for you to be forgiven for all your sin, past, present, and future. He will advocate for you and you will be acquitted. Although you are guilty to spend eternity in hell, you will not have to if you come to Christ. If you come to Christ today and you say two things, I am a sinner, or probably three things, I am a sinner, forgive me, 
I will live for you. I will live for you. I'm a sinner. Forgive me, and from this day forward, I will live for you. Your word will be a light into my path, a lamp into my path, and a light into my feet. I will hide it in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's Christian conversion. And then we need to live it. We need to see it in little things in our life, like how we react to people. Are we going to act in hostility and anger, or are we going to act in forgiveness and humility? Are we going to use our mouth to cuss God, or are we going to use our mouth to, to sing His praises? There's so much more we could say about the likenesses of sin in our lives. But the Holy Spirit can make that known to you. So, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I will live for you. I will follow you. I will live a t my life as a testimony that I'm a Christian. And people will know it because of what I say and what I do. How many people are willing to... Say that this morning by raising your hand. How many of you are willing to say that? Make that commitment to the Lord today. I, how many are you willing to make that commitment? It should be across the... I see that, yeah. It should be across the board. Everyone should be raising their hand. Everyone. Willing to make such a commitment to the Lord. Willing to make such a commitment. Now we're going to move into our segment with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Perhaps there's somebody here today who has been on the fence... And you need, to make, you need to come clean with the Lord. You need to make a fresh commitment to the Lord. Well, I stand with you in that. I need to make a fresh commitment before the Lord. Sometimes I allow myself just to kind of go through the motions and let the fire go out. You can join in prayer with me, a prayer of a new commitment before the Lord, and then we'll have communion. If there's some kind of sin in your life that you've been allowing in your life, before you take communion, you need to make it right. If you've never come to Christ today, or at all, and you want to, if you've come to Christ today, or you want to know more about how to be a Christian, come talk to me after church. Just come up to me and say, I'd like to know more about how to be a Christian. I can either talk to you or put you with someone who can tell you how to do that. Well, let's pray. Father, we do become um, kind of isolated at this point, Lord, where we're just me and you. And we recognize our need I'm hoping we recognize our need for forgiveness. To live a life without condemnation is where you want us to be, Lord. Not that we deny that we are sinners, but that we're, we've been forgiven for our sin. That's where the condemnation, the no condemnation lies. And so we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that, that the word is clear, that our sin will never condemn us, even when we sin, John said. But we want to be right before you every moment of the day. We want our lives to be committed to you, to the word. We can get so self-absorbed and so self-focused in this world. The world promotes that and fosters it. So help us not to be that. Help us to live a life that would, that's in obedience to the word and that um, reflects our faith in you. And the world's going to challenge that. The devil's going to challenge it. Everything... Hell in the world will come against this. And we'll want to give up because sometimes being a Christian is so difficult. But if we walk in the Spirit, if we walk in the light as you are in the light, we'll be empowered and have fellowship with one another. We pray for your blessing, Lord. Um, may we put all sin, any sin, at your altar of forgiveness before we partake. And may this be a time of renewal for us, a fresh commitment to follow you with our heart, our mind, and with our obedience. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're going to help me serve the communion, would you please come forward? I appreciate that. I think we need four men. Please. All right. Like always, we're going to partake together, so you'll have to remove the wafer from the cup, and we'll partake together.
David, would you lead us in prayer over, over both elements? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, a chance to remember what Jesus did for us. Thank you, Lord, for the experience and, and to um, quit him first. We thank you for the elements and the time of, of worship. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can go be seated. David, you can go sit down. Michael, you can find your seat. Mickey, you can find your seat. Thank you, Amanda. That's so appropriate. What can wash away my sin? Amen. We're going to partake on this together, okay? Let's do that. And then the cup as well. Are you going to lead us on our closing hymn? Thank you. Would you all please rise? We're going to close with praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Amen.